Um, we, we did a lot of reconnaissance on, on possible targets. Uh, I think under, at that time it was called Blue Spoon. So, uh, so exactly. Blue Spoon, they were looking at Blue Spoon prior to it becoming just cause. And uh, they, they knew that it was going to deteriorate, so they had to have a plan. And uh, so we started doing some of the, uh, the reconnaissance on different key leaders, facilities, those types of things, uh, and building actual target packets. Uh, but we also needed uh, the ability to infiltrate uh, either land, sea, or air. So we started, look, we started training really hard at the fast rope. Uh, rappelling was was just phasing out. The fast rope was just phasing in. Uh, we got it was at the point where we didn't have airframes in a lot of cases that had the fast rope mounts. So we were doing uh, we were bringing uh, UH ones from the theater guys, and uh, we would hook the fast ropes up to the jungle penetrator booms, and we kind of cut our teeth uh, with with the UH ones initially, and then we transitioned over to the Blackhawks. So uh, so working the fast rope, working the uh, the spies and the fries. I mean that uh, it's it's easier to get uh, get into some of those places uh, where you can't land uh, you know vertically through uh, or you can't parachute uh, fast rope and then the uh, same thing we started working real hard at uh, and we actually looked back at uh, some of the guys who had gone before us we looked at a lot of the stuff that the SOG did uh, back in Vietnam we looked at a lot of the stuff that. Uh, that um, fifth group had done. So they had B-52 tips. You know, B-52 was the uh, the ODB, I think, over for uh, B-520 over in uh, Vietnam. So we started looking at their tips and because, uh, you know, the jungle, tropical environment. So anything from how to rig, how to clean, you know, how to uh, protect. So all those things, you know, night vision was uh, was just coming of age uh, as well. So we had to, had to modify the B-52 tips, basically. Yeah, and the, uh, the the rehearsals for Panama uh, basically was a lot of aircraft centric, and a lot of um, a, a lot of direct action centric. So, so in other words, we were uh, we were you know, sliding down fast ropes. We were uh, going after targets because what we uh, our initial mission going in was uh, was to take down lines of communication. So, what we wanted to do was anything from. Uh, you know, from telephone exchanges, TV exchanges, um, you know, taking down, taking his, taking down Noriega's ability to communicate uh, was was heavy, and then also uh, finding him. The uh, you know he had gone to ground real quick. There had been a coup attempt prior, and, uh, and then he he disappeared, kind of went off the net, laid low, and uh, so it was a matter of uh, it were were his where were his friends, where were his family, where were his buildings, you know, where were the, where were the places that that he would go to ground and hide. And uh, so that that had to get us in rapidly, generally by uh, by air, and uh, reinforce rapidly, generally by ground. Uh, but we had to be able to, to go in and hold a key piece of terrain for a short period of time. So that's kind of what, what we focused on with the mission rehearsals. Yeah. Th so I, th I think the success of a lot of the just cause missions were because of the relationships. The, um, the not only the relationship between the teams uh, within the company and the, and the ability to do command and control, but also when the six seventeenth rolled in, you know, we were able to. That's who we partnered with. So again, uh, fast rope. Roping was in its infancy, so we were trying a lot of things that uh, that wasn't in a book written down. So the ability to work side by side with the six seventeenth and actually work through our SOPs because we're training you're training the pilots just as uh, much as you're training the guys that are roping. So your ability to communicate your time warnings, getting getting out the rope out without it coming back up into the rotor wash. I mean the fact that we used to just toss that rope. Uh, then we figure out okay well, if you snap link it to a kit bag, if you put a, uh, a, a, a a light, a chem light, you know, four foot up on that thing so that you know if it's laying on the ground flat or if it's actually in the air. So, because at night, a lot of the stuff and the nods that we had at the time weren't, weren't, weren't the best. I think we were using PVS fives primarily, uh, transitioning maybe to the sevens. And uh, so your ability to do stuff at night, throwing that rope, making sure that it, uh, that it cleared all the obstacles that is laying on the ground. Cause we did have a couple people that got hurt. And, uh, and then again, a lot of it was, it was just the, uh, the give and take of in the training of, of being able to tell that that rope is on the ground, that it's not dangling five feet from the ground. So the uh, you're training your rope masters and the guys on the rope. So the uh, again the relationships and being able to build those relationships and have that familiarity with the guy to your left and the right. That was I think what made a lot of it successful. It was rope memorization. It was it was standard operating procedures. It was SOP. Yeah, the the uh, for the Radio Nacional mission, the uh, there there was not much intel to go on. Again, it was uh, it was it was a quick turn, 
And uh, so basically it was a map. I mean, we had everything that you had on the map. So uh, and that, that was it. I mean, there were no pictures, nothing, nothing else to go after because it's not something that we had trained for. But the mission sets that Charlie Company was, was capable of executing was, was, was good for that mission. Um, so, yeah, so the intel was, uh, was very light uh, for Radio Nacional. And uh, we, we basically everything off of, uh, off of a map. So on that western side of the uh, of the roof, now now you're looking at a based on the obstacles, you're you're looking at a corner of it, and uh, so the so the helicopter and he's got he's got to be in the wind, he's got to st keep everything stable, the rope goes, and you're looking at that thing, and the uh, the helicopter could drift, you know, laterally, and uh, that that the roof looked like a postage stamp, and our, our biggest concern at that point was the uh, you didn't want that thing to drift over the, uh, the the front of the building basically and then you slide all the way down so we got out of that thing as fast as we could oh true yeah the uh, and again the outside it was like a circus the uh, and it was it was the weirdest I'd ever seen it in that uh, you had all that stuff going on you had the firemen trying to fight the fire you had the you had the people in the street you had people cheering you you had guys shooting at you and uh, so it, it was just pandemonium it was almost surreal uh, to the point of where uh, when JJ and I ran across the street and there was rounds kicking up behind us and we had to dive behind one of the big old concrete bus stops we're laughing and uh, you were actually just that nervous laugh to, to get rid of your tension but it, it was comical and uh, so we made our way to the beach and got on the birds and uh, I think it boils down in, in my mind to, to, to leadership, the people, uh, the, the, the training that the company did, and then the ability to innovate. I mean, we had uh, we had all four of those in, in abundance. And uh, with, with the since it was in its infancy, that mission, you know, the ability for the guys to think on their feet and innovate um, was, was key. And actually, I see it today. I, I just spent some time with uh, with General Baudet and uh, Sergeant Major Eckert. And uh, that's one of the things that he's pushing is the fact that uh, you've got to be able to innovate. You've got to be able to get ahead. You've got to be able to think in the future. And uh, so I, I, uh, it, it makes me feel good that we haven't lost that. That was a legacy.